Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back here to my channel where I play Planet Zoo. I'm Nissa and today I'm going to make a room from this beautiful red crown crane. But as if you have checked your Zoopedia, you know it, the red crown crane has some interspecies enrichment with the Japanese macaque. So of course we're gonna give it a roommate. The red crown crane are one of the largest cranes in the world. It can grow up to one and a half meter, which would be around five feet. The size of a, well, maybe not a arid sized human, but the size of a human still. And their wingspan can grow up to 2.4 meters, meaning eight feet. A full grown crane will be between 8 and 9.5 kilos that will be around 18 to 21 pounds but the male is bigger so of course the females won't grow to uh, nine and a half kilo uh, the game chooses to call it red crown crane this is one of its name and i think they chose this because it's an let's face it this game is also for kids and it's for old and it's pretty much for everyone so they wanted a name that everyone could pronounce and a name that was kind of rememorable but it also called the japanese crane uh, and i think the big distinction here is that maybe they want to add other cranes later on and if they do that then the red crown crane are easier to recognize because that tells us something about how they look compared to other cranes where the japanese crane you could forget and uh, if you have more cranes which one of them it is so i think that's why they went with the red crown it also called cruise Japon japonesis and I think by my pronunciation of that, you know why they didn't <laughs> win with that. This red crown crane have its name because of the red bare skin on the top of it head. And this, this has me confused because I thought it was feathers, red feathers on the top of the skin. So I, you know me, I went to Google and I looked up pictures and I looked up pictures and I looked up pictures and all I can say is that the feathers on this red piece is either smaller or gone. Um, it doesn't look like human skin at all what I can see up there, uh, but it isn't the same texture, but it just ain't the same texture as uh, the crane have on the rest of its head. So I can confirm or deny that it's its skin we can see, but clearly there's a difference. The rest of the spur is mainly white or black and the most common one will have this white main color uh, and then the black would be like uh, on some of the swing and when you look at the birds in the game and also on pictures it looks like they're butter black but when they firm out their wings you can actually see they're butter white and then the wings just covers the butt when they have their wing in but that's only the most common red crown crane there are more kind of variations they're young and this confused me also um but they also have white feathers mixed in with shades of brown and gray and that just didn't make sense to me because again i played the game i have young in the game right now and they are like this reddish brown, light brown color. But actually looking at these pictures on Google, I do see that they have this light reddish brown color. But I do also see this uh, white small feathers. I don't know if it's called feathers in English, this baby version of feathers, but you know what I mean. Um, but it, they do have this kind of white underbelly, a tiny bit and then maybe some gray around some of them have around the eyes and a bit on the back um but there looks to be many variations of this the beak on the young ones are mainly this yellow dotty color but the grown-ups have a deep green color and it's very sharp and that's mainly because they don't 
like when the lion attack its prey, it goes in with the biting and the clawing. That's not the technique this bird used. They are using their beak as a spear, so it's spearing their food. They are omnivores, which means they eat. Of course, they eat these fish and amians and rodents, which we know, but they also eat reeds and other marsh plants. And this gives the crane limited places to be because they need a place where there's water. So there are fish and there are these plants, but they need to be able to reach them also. Which makes this wetlands area extremely important for the red crown crane. They mainly live between Russia and East Asia, but they prefer the milder climates. Uh, so they can live in the cold, but they prefer not to, which most of us understand. They also live in the warmer climates in Southeast Asia. They are monogamous, which means they made for life. And during this mating period where they trying to find the one they use this dancing ritual which they actually added in the game but i don't think i have any footage of it because i thought they did this every single mating season apparently they don't in the game it seems like they only use this when you add new new birds to the habitats which is a issue for me personally but uh, they all they use this stance where they flop out their wings and they kind of just run easily over the ground and they also kind of just bounce up and down kind of like a ball. They also have this unison call they use uh, to kind of signify you and me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they could also choose to use this and this is why I thought they should add it more in the game to uh, kind of between mates to tell each other stuff uh, both to if one of them is leaving the other one can tell them to stay by using this dance and call to say please stay with me um but it, they can also just use them as a way to say i want to play <laughs> something um i don't know what crowns play but they can use it to say i want to play in the wild they can live up to 30 years, but in zoos they live up to 50. It's the second rare crane in the world, but only heaven at the point of this article. It's from Natural Ge Geographic. And at the point of the release of this article, which I couldn't find, uh, there are only 1830 adults left in the nature. The biggest threat to the red crown crane is the fact that they live in this wetlands and really depend on this wetlands to get enough food and also to mate and breed and live with their flock. But both the state and the size of the wetlands are decreasing. Of course, some of the wetlands area is limited by human activity, but also by natural dry spell caused by climate changes. And again, we can do what we can about the climate change, but we can't go back and make sure there are no, there never was a dry spell or anything like that. So there will always be dry spells, but the intensity and the frequency of them have become worse. There's also been a lot of spring fires, specifically in China and Russia, which dry out the area also. They already are being done a lot uh, to try to help these beautiful birds and as of now they are all legally protected from hunting in every single country they're found in this article also mentioned that there are a lot of groups that helping by coordinating and global it if or this could also be depending on some zoos and it specifically named the International Crane Foundation and one so if you want to do a different if you want to help that would be a place to start. In the Hokkaido colony in northern Japan they have a non-migrating flock of cranes and because they're not migrating they really are more dependent 
on the area they already live in. And the citizens of Hokkaido here have really done it different because they set up feeding stations for the cranes. So they still have the area they live in that they need, but now they can at least get the food they need every single day uh, because of these feeding sedation. And this flock isn't decreasing anymore, it's actually increased very slowly, but it helps and th the birds there aren't thriving yet, but they give birth to more than they're dying, so that's a step in the right direction. A lot of other places they have migrating flock throughout China, Korea, Mongolia and Russia. Um, and in these places they have set up a lot of sanctuaries, but again that depends on the birds actually choosing to be in that specific area when they migrate. For me personally I thought I was going to skip this animal because it just thought it was kind of boring. But then I got this idea of the habitat I wanted with the macaque apes and I chose to do this and because of doing this research now I actually think it's a pretty cool animal. Um, again, my love with the cranes are pretty much on the stalk that we have here in uh, Denmark or the... I don't know what the Danish crane is called. Um, but we both have a stalk, which is kind of like a crane, and we have a crane in Denmark. And they have more of my love because I th I live five minutes away from a few of them. And uh, I'm not gonna tell anyone where because I don't want anyone to disturb them. But actually I think this animal I would like to see in real life. I. I do understand why I would want it to be in a zoo now and I do understand why it is also a beautiful animal. Well, let's talk a bit about the Japanese macaque. I will try to do this a bit faster so I can get it all into this video. But the Japanese macaque is the only animal, I think, the only animal this far that I actually think we should call its Latin name because Jap Japanese macaque sounds cool, but macaca fuscata, it just sounds fun and awesome and kind of what this animal embodies. So I kind of like the Latin name more than the everyday name, which is the Japanese macaque. Or is it? Because it's also called the uh, Japanese snow macaque, snow macaque or just snow monkey. Again, we have one of these animals with just so many names. Uh, it isn't that widespread, it only lives on, and I'm gonna butcher these names, so I'm gonna put them uh, in the button at the video so you can read it for yourself if you're better at pronouncing stuff uh, as I am. But it only lives on Hanshu, Sikoku, and Kyushu, which is Japanese islands. They live in the subalpines, subtropical, deciduous, and evergreen forest mountains. They can live in the cold all the way down to minus 15 degrees Celsius, which would be minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can actually run around in up to a meter of snow. That would be three feet of snow. And because they live these places with a lot of snow, they actually have this kind of funny ritual of what we're gonna call them. Uh, both by bathing in hot springs, uh, which is warmth by the nearby volcanoes. But they actually also documented cases of them making snowballs in the snow and especially the kids making snowballs and like pushing the snowballs through the snow so they get bigger and bigger. And there have also been recorded cases uh, where they play around with stones when the snow ain't around. So it's kind of a 
both clever but also funny animal this way. The males are the double size of the female and they can grow up to 57 centimeter in length and that would be 22 inches in length uh, and weigh up to 11.3 kilos so it would be 25 pounds. The female, however, can grow up to 52.3 centimeter in length, which would be 20 and a half inch, 8.4 kilos, uh, being 18.5 pounds. Their tail are really short for a monkey. It's actually only uh, 7 to 12 centimeter, which would be around two and a half inch to four inches. They live about 22 to 27 years. Their fur varies from gray to brown and in the winter they grow a secondary coat that is extra isolating to maintain the body heat uh, but if that was enough then they wouldn't bathe in these hot springs. They have these naked faces of as we've seen before with other monkeys and they actually have cheek pouches uh, kind of like if you think of a hamster when it hides its food in the cheeks the macaque can do the same when a macaque reaches its sexual maturity then they their faces and their butts became this bright red which we kind of know them from they have thumbs which means they can grab onto different kind of stuff and because they do this they are actually both able to walk around on four legs which is which is mainly how we see them but they can also if they carry things walk around on two legs they are of course not as stable on two legs and as they are on four uh, kind of like babies when they're in that stage where they know most of the time crawls but they can't actually walk around they are opportunistic omnivore which means they eat whatever the opportunity presents so if there's plant they eat plants if there are smaller animals they eat smaller animals it's they just also because they live in these harsh climates they just have to be able to eat anything that comes their way they live both on the ground and in the trees and they actually prefer to eat on the ground um, but they always sleep up in the tree of course also for protection but also because it's actually is their natural habitat when they sleep in the trees they either do it individually or snug together uh, to keep the heat so in colder periods you will see more of this huddling in together the tribes they live in is mostly about 20 to 30 individuals but can actually be over a hundred the society of the macabre actually is mainly built up by females. Um, the leader is a alpha female. The hierarchy you have is inherited from your mom. Even though the alpha male is an alpha male, then he's still just not the alpha. His main concern is offspring and protection and then of course movement because the males immigrate just like we talked about with the capuchin monkeys last week. I can link the video below if you want to see it because uh, there I'm gonna go more in details with this project of uh, migrating today I'm gonna talk a bit faster over it but um, basically uh, when they reach the sexual maturity, which would be around these four years, then they migrate. And after that, they would do it every second to every fourth year after that. They don't just go out on their own, they move with the other males uh, from the tribe that needs to move on at the same time. And they mainly do this at mating seasons because it is pretty much the female that gives them the place to mating season of where they're going to be basically <laughs> um, so it kind of gives them an open opening to get into the new tribe uh, beside 
being this projector of the group uh, or the tribe and the other males and the females and kids and everything, they also have a parental care. Uh, meaning they carry their kids and they huddle with them and they groom them and they of course protect them. And not only their own kids but the, the tribe's kids. The females don't move around like the males. Of course, they move with the entire tribe, but they don't move like the males do every fourth year. They stay, and again, we talked about this last week with the capuchin, but the females just stay where they're born in that tribe. That's also why you can have these this female that's always on the top, because the ink <laughs> gonna come any new females in from outside the tribe and knocking her down. All of the female kids get status as she has, we talked about this before, but I just wanted to add that the younger siblings outrank the older siblings. So the younger the offspring, the higher the hierarchy they get. The females select their mate, meaning the ma males don't have a say in this. Uh, which I kind of love, <laughs> um, but they have a few criteria. Um, they base their pick on the rank the males have in the hier hierarchy, um, both because they would like a stronger, better male, but also how long they've been in the tribe. Just to put it in human terms, if you see a man that's at 10 but then next to him is a man that's at 9 but because he have been in this tribe longer and protected you and all the other individuals much longer then you would pick the 9 but you wouldn't pick the 2 because that's too long of a span if that makes sense <laughs> yeah and oh I, I totally forgot the fact that she will never pick someone she made it with before so even though she did last time with a real high ranked male, then she won't pick him again. Never go back to an ex. Never. Always watch it new. New is always better, like Barney Stinson said. Which also do mean that the longer a male stay in the same tribe, the harder it is for him to be picked by a female. And uh, even though he will most likely be picked when the, the males are of number three to one. When the female have chosen her mate, then they stay together for approximately 1.6 day. Yes, <laughs> that was a real long courtship. And through that one and a half day and a little more, they would sleep together, eat together, go around together, make babies together and after that goodbye and then the next thing she does is finding the next mate because she she needs to make sure that her belly is full of baby so the next thing she does is just to find the next one the mating season is from march till september so you can really see that she she can go through a lot of males in that period, which it which also is why it would make sense for the other males to move during this season, because there are no females left in this tribe, so I try the next tribe, and there will hopefully be some females there who would like me. <laughs> then she will be pregnant, and this is actually really interesting. She will be pregnant between 157 and 188.5 days. The interesting part isn't the big span between it. The interesting part is based on where they live. So in some areas of Japan, all of the females have this 157-ish pregnancy. And other places in Japan, the females have 188.5 days of pregnancy. Then when it gets time to give birth, then she will actually leave her group. Not permanently, she will come back, um, but just to have a nice place to give birth and 
being a little alone, get some privacy, uh, welcome her baby into the world, and then later on she will rejoin the group. And then, as all monkeys I know, she will give milk to the baby, and she will do that for <laughs> for six to eight months. But rarely, but sometimes they will actually. Uh, uh, give milk to the baby up to two and a half years after. The ending of this milk giving session thing will normally end when it's time to get a new baby because the new baby needs the milk. But if you don't get pregnant for some reason then you can just keep on going with your old baby. They also have a eco <laughs> ecological role um, in the same ways also as we talked with, about with the Capuchins, where they spread seeds, but where the Capuch Capuchin did it because they leave out parts of the fruit date. The macabre actually eats it all, and then it goes through the system of the macabre and out the other end, and uh, and it will, the seeds will survive all the way through and then where the macaque go pooping, the new tree or bush or what it is can grow. Um, and then they also actually have another role which I think planet to have to work with at some point because they feed the sick deer. Yeah, you heard that right. They feed the sick Year. Mainly because when they crawl around in the trees, then they knock off some leaf um, that falls to the ground and this to get there will eat it. Also sometimes they just throw things down that they can eat, but mainly because when they crawl around in this tree, they aren't too protective of the trees and then a lot of rain will fall down to these deers. The conservation stage status are listed as least concerned. But there are still issues with the macabres. Again, as most of the animals we talk about here uh, on my channel, their habitat are being destroyed <laughs> again. Uh, and then they also have issues with uh, overpopulations of humans. And actually, a lot of places it's already been so bad that the only reason that the macaque isn't uh, dying out yet is because the humans in those populations choose to uh, s uh, feed the apes. Not completely, but like uh, give them supplement feeding uh, so they can get the food they still need. And then of course we also have issues with deforestation which have again taken away both the house and also the food on this, these trees which have given the humans in the area a completely different issue. Which is that um, the macaque is a farmer's worst nightmare. Uh, again, an animal that doesn't know the difference between what's yours and what's mine. And these farmers feel they just grow a lot of food. <laughs> um, so of course the monkeys are going that way. Which again, some place they fix with feeding <laughs> the macaques before they get to the fields. But uh, it also have lead to a lot of deaths of the macaque. About 5,000 are killed each year in Japan. And it's not because the law isn't there, because the macaque have been protected since 1947. But here they put it in this article, they put it as the right of farmers have taken precedence over law. Which I interpret that it means that the farmer have the right to the field which the macaque invaded therefore it have the right to kill it. That's how I understand it. It might be wrong. So that's why I chose to read the part. Um, but hopefully I understood it correctly. Uh, another threat to the Japanese macaque is cross breeding. Uh, because where they live, there are many other macaques also. 
and they yeah when the males move tribe then sometimes they move into the wrong tribe uh, which we really can't blame them but the issue is that these crossbreed animals just isn't japanese macaques anymore uh, maybe we get a new funny breed at some times, uh, but at this point it is an issue. And then there also live wild dogs in the area, which of course will kill the macaque. Even though it's not listed as endangered, uh, it is protected under the conservation of an international trade in endangered spe uh, species, cities. Epidix 2, which pr mostly just state that we have to take measure to make sure that even though it isn't endangered, that it doesn't become endangered, uh, as I understand it. The info here on the Japanese macaque I got from New England Primate Conservancy. Conserv 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 uh, it will of course be linked below along with my info from the uh, red crown crane. And that was all of the info I got for you today. But if you think that means I'm done talking, then you are really wrong. Because I also need to tell you this education board I use today is from the Steam Workshop. Uh, and they are made by Shista and they are also linked below. Then I choose to color my donation boxes with this light light blue symbolizing the ice um, and then this red uh, symbolizing the crown of the crane. I really went into this with just the idea that I needed a home for two very very different animals. I knew I wanted some border in there of course uh, and I wanted to use the new um, uh, terrain effect uh, which I used and it works nicely I, know, I knew I wanted some type of building that I know wouldn't be Asian or Japanese but kind of what I think of when I think Japanese um, again I never been there and I n never seen a lot of pictures actually I, I, I think I'm just one of those people who live in my own bubble so anything that doesn't happen right in front of me I just, just forget to care about it it's not like I don't care it's just like I kind of forget about it uh, the rest of the world <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I wanted this building and I knew as you saw in the start that I wanted some wooden pieces. I wanted something black and I wanted something red. Uh, I did work a lot with the idea of this light wood and then I wanted details in black and red. But went back on it and made instead this uh, red and black wooden building. Um, the middle pieces I just added on the inside what was to stop the uh, macaques from getting out and climbing. It clearly didn't help, so uh, so fortunately uh, I had the escaped uh, turned off in this game. Uh, I also do always do because sometimes it, you just never can figure out why they are escaping and sometimes it's because of a glitch. So I always turn it off. I also knew that I really wanted a snow part. Um, I didn't know how big it was. I, it wasn't my plan to make it th this big, but I really wanted the macaque to be happy about the area. So therefore I just added the amount of snow they wanted. Uh, which actually I think pans out well because of all the trees I added. It seems a lot smaller than it actually is. I was a bit concerned by making uh, the um, habitat this deep, but actually the animals rarely are in the far end corner, um, so it's really not an issue. And also I have enough 
of animals in here for the size of the habitat. I, I actually think it's still bigger than it have to be, um, but I, I think uh, you have you have really no issues by seeing the animals now. If you can't see them, then it's your own damn fault. But uh, that's pretty much that for me today, guys. Uh, I really hope you will enjoy this cinematic and I will be back in a minute or two. So guys, that was my habitat for the red crown crane and the Japanese macaque. I really hope you enjoyed it and you know the drill. Like, subscribe and turn on the bell of notifications so you know the next time I upload a video. I'm Nisa and I really hope to see you again, either in the comments below or in the next video. Bye!